My name is Beth and I'm a programming assistant for the St. Johns County Public Library System. And I'm here today at the Lombia's House in downtown St. Augustine. Um, this is a historic property built sometime before 1763 and um, it passed through the hands of a rather infamous St. Augustine resident from the 18th century, Jesse Fish. Jesse Fish lived in St. Augustine during both Spanish and British rule, and I'm going to learn a little bit more about him um, after we go inside and speak with Charles Tingley, a local historian with the St. Augustine Historical Society. This program is part of the St. Charles County Public Library System's um, year-long celebration for St. John's County's 200th anniversary that's happening throughout 2021. So let's go inside and meet with Charles Tingley. Well, thank you so much for meeting with me today, Mr. Tingley. Can you please tell me a little bit about who Jesse Fish was and why we're even here today at the Lombia's house? Well, thank you, Beth. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to the viewers for the uh, St. John's County Public Library here in the historic Fernandez Lombia's house. Um, the, the Lombia's house was built sometime in the 18th century. We're not exactly sure when. Uh, it was uh, originally a one-story house owned by a uh, Senor Fernandez, uh, and that's why we hyphenate the name Fernandez Lombia's, because the owners in the late 19th, early 20th century were the Lombia's family. Uh, that's the, the case with many of the hyphenated uh, house names that we have in St. Augustine. They are the earliest known owner and the owner that's associated with the building the longest. But I particularly wanted to bring you here. This property is managed by the St. Augustine Historical Society, but it's one of the houses that Jesse Fish, the subject of our talk this morning, um, acted as real estate agent for the Fernandezes uh, when they left for Cuba in 1763. Uh, it's a very typical Spanish colonial house with the arched loggia and uh, upstairs uh, wooden galleria. Uh, it's a very small version of the Spanish colonial house. It's only uh, two rooms up and two rooms down, uh, but it's very typical of the time period. The, um, so let's get on to Mr. Fish. Okay. <laughs> um, Mr. Fish, depending on what sources you use and whether you uh, agree with the English sources or, or the Spanish sources. He can be a villain or a hero or a mix of both. I just like to think of him as an opportunist. Uh, he was sent here when he was 12 or 13 years old uh, in a, approximately uh, 1736 uh, as an apprentice uh, to a Mr. Hicks. And then he became the agent for the Walton Company from New York. Now, Jesse Fish was born in New York. Um, he's from what is today, what is Queens, New York, the, the uh, new town in Queens. And um, the, the Fish family is an old family in New York. And he came here as, as, a, as an apprentice. The Walton Company had been dealing with goods to Florida since 1726. So they already had a relationship with dealing with, with um, St. Augustine. You know, the 18th century, especially the first half, is a time of almost continual war. Uh, and uh, so sometimes it was legal for the Waltons to trade with Florida, and sometimes it was illegal, depending on whether the British and the Spanish were at war or not. And Fish does play a part in this uh, several times as to was he a smuggler or was he a savior because he, he managed to get food in from uh, Charleston when the city was starving in the 1760s. He, he managed to bring supplies in. So um, he was a wheeler dealer. Um, some will paint him with a very broad black brush because he was a slave trader. Uh, and um, But he was apprenticed here and he lived with the Sebastian uh, de Herrera family. Uh, and they had a son who was about his same age, Luciano de Herrera, who was his lifelong friend. And uh, Luciano de Herrera, uh, in addition to Fish, is one of the few people that stay in St. Augustine when the Spanish leave in 1763, uh, 
due to the end of the Seven Years' War. You know, um, when the basic things about St. Augustine in the 18th century is not only there were lots of wars, but uh, the change of sovereignty between uh, the Spanish rule and the British rule in 1763, and then back to the Spanish in 1784. Fish lives through all of those. Uh, Herrera does not. He dies during the British period. But um, uh, Herrera was also a more active spy for the Spanish during the British period. Uh, and we have his letters uh, that prove that. But um, so he's in business here. He's um, bringing things from New York uh, or uh, slaves from Africa, directly from Africa, or the Spanish Caribbean. Uh, in, the, um, in 1747, he's actually sent by the Spanish government to negotiate the release of Spanish prisoners in New York that had been taken during the War of Jenkins' Ear. Uh, so um, the Spanish trusted him with a diplomatic mission like that. In fact, there's a quote by uh, one of the Spaniards who, who said, uh, uh, he seemed more Spanish than foreign because uh, he, had, he had been so inculcated with the, uh, the culture uh, that um, uh, he, he became part of the community. Uh, now, 1763 is probably uh, the beginning of the most important time period for Jesse Fish. Uh, in that um, he and his business partner, uh, John Gordon, acted as the real estate agents for the departing Spaniards. Uh, and this, again, it wasn't exactly legal by the Treaty of Paris that they did this, but um, the, uh, the Spanish supposedly sold their properties to him, so he owned them. Well, that was a sale on paper. Uh, and uh, so we'll show you a map in a few minutes uh, that shows that he owned virtually all of the city lots in St. Augustine. This really uh, steamed the incoming British government uh, in that they had expected to be able to give town lots to incoming settlers. Well, Jesse Fish and John Gordon make that impossible. Uh, they also controlled the church property. Well, the, the, the Brits, first off, no, 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 no. The, the church property, the church and crown uh, in Spain, just as in England, uh, are one and the same, so that's crown property. And that's how the former Spanish monastery, which we're right near, uh, which is now the headquarters of the Florida National Guard, becomes crown property, and they turn it into an army barracks. Um, the um, mission of Nombre de Dios becomes crown property, and the British turn it into a hospital. Uh, the former bishop's house here in St. Augustine gets turned into British period state house. But enough about that. Uh, so this property uh, was all over town, but he had owned a lot of property outside of town as well. As I said, he was a, uh, his main estate was called El Vergel, which means the garden in Spanish. And it's what today we call Fish Island uh, over on Anastasia Island. It was much more of an independent island uh, back uh, before the 1920s when a lot of fill was put in because there was a marsh between it and the mainland of Anastasia Island. Uh, but D.P. Davis filled that in in the 1920s. The, um, to show you the extent of how much property in town fish controlled, uh, there were um, 120 lots in town. Okay. Well, fish controlled 47 of the lots. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, almost half the town. Now, were the Spanish, who had now mostly moved to Cuba, were they expecting payment for? Yes, they were expecting payment. And he does travel to Cuba uh, by special dispensation from the British governor uh, in the 1760s. And we assume that he made some payments okay. then. Now, when the Spanish return in the uh, 1780s, there were some people who tried to claim land uh, and some people who um, uh, actually sued his son because uh, Fish dies in 1789. So Jesse Fish Jr. got sued by uh, one of the people was Hippolito Gonzalez, 
of the Gonzalez Alvarez house, which is in the next block, the oldest house. And they didn't think they get, got enough money for their property from fish. They did get some, yeah. but not enough. And so Ippolito, who's a notary, a legal guy, he decides to sue Jesse Fish Jr. and he gets a little bit more. <laughs> um, uh, fish has at least three children that we know about. Um, uh, he married uh, Sarah Warner, uh, uh, and um, they, so they, they have two children, uh, Jesse Jr. and Phoebe. And um, then uh, he also had a daughter by Eva Fish, a free woman of color, in 1785. Uh, so um, since she was a free woman, we have to con consider that that relationship may have been com completely consensual. Uh, but we don't know for sure. All we know is the church record, that he was recognized mm -hmm. at uh, his daughter's baptism as the father. Now, his son, Jesse Fish Jr., uh, he only has a mixed-race spouse, uh, Clara or Clarissa Fish. And uh, they have seven children together. He recognizes all of them in the church records. Uh, they inherit from him. Uh, so, um, the, um, uh, and there are plenty of descendants of Jesse Fish Jr. Uh, his sister didn't have any descendants. So the claim to a lot of the Fish properties goes through the Furman family, uh, which is related to her, but not a direct descendant. Uh, and they kept uh, lawsuits pending or, or implemented uh, up till around 1900, uh, clouding the titles of land on Anastasia Island, because Elver Hell, his big plantation was 10,000 acres, and it um, included all of Anastasia Island except the King's Quarries and the Watchtower. Uh, he had another uh, 11,000 acre track called Casacola up by the uh, airport, the St. Augustine Airport. So let's go inside and look at that map. That sounds great, thank you. Okay, what we have here is a map from the British period by James Moncrief, the Royal Engineer, showing the extent of Jesse Fish's holdings and his business partner, uh, John Gordon, and his distant relative, Jacob Kipp. Um, so in this first map, you can see the outline of the Castillo de San Marcos right here. So this is St. George Street. And you see Mr. Fish, Mr. Fish, Mr. Fish, <laughs> Mr. Fish, Mr. Fish, Mr. Fish, Mr. Fish, it, and it's like that all over town. Um, so much so we're not even sure which was his townhouse because he owned so much property. He may have shifted from one house to another. Uh, but this shows the, the entire city with properties uh, controlled early in the British period. He, he, he starts selling them off. Uh, when he died, he, he uh, just before he died, he turned over all these properties to the Spanish crown to pay his debts. Uh, and um, he had pretty much become a recluse out at his house on Fish Island at Elver Hill, which was probably the most substantial plantation house uh, built here during the uh, colonial era. Uh, I don't know of any others that was two stories. It was made out of stone. Uh, and, uh, of course, there's just some rubble out there on the site today. Uh, when he died, because he was Protestant, he could not be buried in the Catholic cemetery, so that he, he was buried in the graveyard uh, at his plantation, Elder Hill. And this is a picture from the 1950s uh, as to what his uh, tomb looked like at that time. Uh, it has now been completely vandalized, and there's just a few pieces of stone left. Somebody decided that it was a good idea to tell a story about there was treasure buried in his tomb, oh. and that led to the end of his tomb. Gotcha. <laughs> um, I mentioned that he was a, uh, a, a slave trader. Well, between 1752 and 1763, he imported 144 Africans, and we know them by name. One of the 
great things about Mr. Fish is that he turns up in lots of documents because there were lawsuits and when he died, the uh, Spanish crown impounded his business records because they realized they would need those records. So we have something called the uh, Jesse Fish account book, which uh, uh, lists the slaves where they came from, uh, mainly from Africa. There are a few that are from the Spanish Caribbean. Uh, and then in, when he died, as I said, in, uh, in 1789, we also know that at that time he still owned some slaves. Uh, so he had Tomas, who was 70 years old, Teresa, who was 50, uh, March, who was uh, 35, uh, Maria, his, uh, March's wife, who was 25, their son Enrique, and uh, another son Jorge, and another son Adam. Uh, then there was a another couple, Adam and Judy, who were 50 and 40, uh, and a um, mixed race man uh, who was Jack, who was 80 years old. Mm -hmm. So, um, as with so many people of that era, he was surrounded by African Americans, um, servants uh, working his land. Uh, in the case of Eva Fish, uh, was that a romance? Uh, we don't know. But certainly his son followed in his footsteps having a mixed-race family. Uh, and um, so uh, Fish crosses those three time periods, the, the first Spanish period, British period, second Spanish period, uh, and the way he manages his survival by playing one political entity against the other. Right. Even during the American Revolution, uh, there were a number of very influential uh, people from Charleston held prisoner here. Well, what does Fish do? He realizes after the Revolution, he's gonna have to deal with these important people in Charleston. <laughs> uh, so he sends them oranges out, out of his large orange grove at Elver Hill. And, uh, you know, he is generally credited with being the first person to export oranges from Florida. Uh, he made something called shrub, which is a mixture of alcohol and, and oranges. You put it in barrels so it can ship for a long time. But he also shipped fresh oranges uh, uh, up to Charleston. Uh, Charles, um, the Charleston market was very lucrative for oranges. It said that he made 300 pounds a year uh, off of his oranges. Wow. Uh, he had thousands of trees on Fish Island. You know, because of various freezes, we don't think of North Florida as being a hub of the citrus industry, but it certainly was in the 18th century on up till the Great Freeze of 1895, which wiped out the citrus in places like Mandarin and Satsuma. Uh, and other places, and the citrus industry moves into Central Florida. So, is Fish a villain? Is he a hero that's, that saved the town from starving because he smuggled food in from Charleston? Uh, was he a good guy because he was the agent of the Spanish government to negotiate prison re uh, releases during the War of Jenkins' Ear? I'll let you all decide uh, which way you want to consider Mr. Fish, but he is certainly an interesting individual and a very well-documented individual. And we're very, very happy here at the Historical Society that the state and the city is preserving the site of his Elder Hell plantation. Yes, in fact, there's going to be a video where we walk around and look at that, so you'll have to stay tuned. If you are interested in this topic and want to know a little bit more, come check out some of the books we have in the St. John's County Public Library System. Books like Black Society in Spanish Florida by Jane Landers, or The Houses of St. Augustine 1565 to 1821 by Albert Manusi, or The Houses of St. Augustine by David Nolan. We also have lots of journal articles and all kinds of other books about St. Augustine history. Um, you can check that out on our catalog, www.sjcpls.org. Thank you so much for joining me. I learned so much and I hope you did as well. 
and if you are interested in learning a little bit more there will be a companion video um, coming soon a tour of Fish Island um, on the Matanzas River so stay tuned to the St. Johns County Public Library Systems um, website, Facebook page, and YouTube channel for that video as well as all kinds of great programming for adults, teens, and children. We hope we see you at the library very soon. Have a great day!